these days commitment in religion has at best a mixed reputation radicals, fundamentalists, fanatics aren't they the homophobes, the misogynists, the racists the groups that terrorists come from and though we think that we, the tolerant, rational moderates are rather better than that so we look to side with similarly liberal minded people in temples, churches, synagogues and mosques and we support their anti radicalization program aimed at controlling the very real risk that certain people under the influence of certain types of religious enthusiasm will turn bad or sorry, will turn mad or bad and dangerous to know. But I think there are some problems with this outlook that associates bad religion with extremism and good religion with moderation. Firstly, isn't the ultimate in religious moderation the apathy shown by most of my teachers and the bland, uninspiring school assemblies they led? Moreover, pretty much all the religious figures who are most admired have not been moderate. They've been radically committed. Moses, the Buddha, Jesus, Paul, Muhammad, Guru Nanak, all enthusiasts some to the point of getting themselves killed. And in the sphere of practical action, we can all point to figures whose religious commitment has led them down impressive serv- paths of impressive service to others. Albert Schweitzer, for example, Martin Luther King, Mother Teresa, Helga Kamara. And so it seems that while uncommitted religion is always rather tepid and pointless, committed religion may be very bad and it may be very good so maybe the best approach might be to commit yourself to something that is really worthy of that commitment of course when we try to do this we find it isn't easy the exercise we did on how you spend your money might have shown you not only that you have commitments but also maybe that you didn't entirely choose these commitments consciously to reflect your deepest values. Your commitment, like mine, may be affected by all sorts of desires and fears working in as powerfully, and at least in part, subconsciously. As Paul lamented, I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do I do not do, but what I hate I do. Yet we are not automata. Despite the psychological difficulties, we can influence what we commit ourselves to. So I invite you to ask, what might a good and practical religious commitment be like for you? I'd like to suggest two ingredients, intellectual assent and passionate enthusiasm, both based on a bit of soul-searching. By intellectual assent, I just mean that we're not going to be truly committed to something we think unlikely to be true. <coughs> In the Middle Ages, chantry priests dedicated their lives to singing masses to reduce the length of time dead people would spend in purgatory. If you don't share the belief in purgatory and in the efficacy of singing masses as a means of reducing time spent there, you would be unlikely to approach the job of the chantry priest with real commitment. In selecting this example, I want to, to, to pick a belief I could be confident that none of us hold. I chose purgatory. However, the example is extreme. You are also very unlikely ever to consider committing yourself to life as a chantry priest, particularly if the world ceases to exist in England with the Reformation, and if you are a woman your gender would have barred you from the job anyway. You may though think that as a Unitarian you have put behind you not just purgatory and chantry priests but also all the vast chunks of scriptural literalism and theological fantasizing that characterize much mainstream Christianity leaving you only with beliefs that have a solid rational basis. 
I am the last person to decry this process, but I doubt it is ever complete. We know from psychology and neuroscience that our ideas do not derive entirely from conscious logical deduction, but are also the product of upbringing, culture, group think, habit, the physical environment, genetic, and so on. Therefore, if we don't believe chanted priests can reduce the time souls spend in purgatory, it's not just because we think there are no good rational grounds for it. No, if we don't sing matters for the dead, it's also because we don't live in the Middle Ages. So it might it be that some of your priorities may be based on religious, social or political ideas that in your heart of hearts you suspect actually might not be true. Only you can work that one out. You may notice I've set the bar of truth fairly low, suggesting it is unwise to try and commit to ideas you suspect are unlikely to be true. This does not mean you should only be committed where you are certain. The disciple Thomas is of course popularly known as Doubting Thomas. I suspect largely because of his attitude to the other disciples' stories of the resurrection as per our second reading. To a Unitarian, Thomas's wish for evidence may seem pretty reasonable. Jesus responds by providing that evidence and then pronouncing his famous line. Because you have not because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. This can be interpreted as, uh, interpreted as an assertion that it is a good thing to believe without evidence. However, it can also be seen as a recognition that on some key questions, the kind of proof Thomas wants is not generally available, and this should not stop us from engaging with the life of faith. Since Mother, now Saint Teresa's death, it has become known that her inner spiritual life was characterised by long periods of doubt and no sense of the presence of God. She wrote, for example, in a letter, Where is my faith? Even deep down there is nothing but emptiness and darkness. If there be God, this is Saint Teresa speaking, if there be God, please forgive me. When I try to raise my thoughts to heaven, there is such convicting emptiness that those very thoughts return like sharp knives and hurt my very soul. To me, what is remarkable here is not that Teresa was frankly not very open during her lifetime about such a challenging inner life, but rather that despite it, she was able to sustain over decades such remarkable demanding work in India. And Doubting Thomas is prepared to die for his commitments to Jesus and his work. When Jesus and the twelve hear of Lazarus' death, the disciples urge Jesus not to go to Bethany because it would be dangerous. It is Thomas who then says, let us go with him so that we may die with him. Thomas has his questions, but that doesn't stop him being committed. I find these stories of Thomas and Teresa challenging in a positive sense. A questioning faith, perhaps devoid of many emotional high points, may still be the basis for a life of commitment. But how do you find your commitment? How do you decide what to be committed to? We sometimes talk of people having a vocation. And those Christians who are considering taking holy orders are generally expected to spend some time considering and testing whether this is truly their calling. The process is not about whether having, for example, vicars is a good thing in itself. That is taken for granted. Rather, the potential candidate for holy order is seeking to discern whether that life is right for him or her. 
traditional Christians might describe this as God having a plan for the believer and the latter normally with some guidance seeking to understand what that plan is. You may or may not be comfortable with this language of God and his plans. I'm not, unless much of it is interpreted metaphorically. However, I do think there's something in the process, in seeking to get in touch with deep hopes and urges to love and accept oneself and others, and to see what emerges from that in terms of enthusiasm and cause for action. I suspect that might sound a bit abstract, it even has the meeting. So let me talk about something concrete. I described earlier how I spent seven years being unimpressed in RE lessons and bored in assembly at an Anglican school. It is therefore perhaps a helpful irony that years later I spent one of the most important days of my religious life at an Anglican parish church that the school headmaster attended. The day was led by three women from an independent church in Washington, D.C. There was nothing remarkable about the presentational skills of the women, or, as far as I could gather, about their Christian beliefs. What did impress me, though, was that their church seemed rich in all the important ways. Their members gave unusually large amounts of time and money to church activities and crucially church members themselves chose those activities. One or two of them might propose an activity and seek to persuade others to join them in setting up and running it. The activities were very diverse, some spiritual, some practical, working with a wide range of people around America's capital city, which, it appears, as a good deal more social deprivation than I for one had previously realised. I know I am painting a rosy picture here. I expect that like every human institution, this church had its failings and failures. So what? The church was clearly achieving a lot. Through members who enjoyed real and linked commitments, to spiritual openness and social activism. During our day together, the three women encouraged us too to listen to where the Spirit led us and to follow that lead. Twelve of us were so impressed that over the next year or so, we met together to do just that. There was nothing novel in the techniques used by the women on the day and the twelve of us afterwards. Prayer, meditation, some worship, reading, discussion, creatively imagining ourselves as characters or bystanders at different events in the Gospel. You have probably engaged in most of these activities yourself and know what you find helpful and what you don't. For me, as for most of the other eleven, this work did not lead to any major changes in lifestyle, though it did perhaps influence me not to make one change I have been considering. More importantly, I'm left with a yearning, an inspiration when making important decisions, to live my life less in the state described by the narrator of Frost's Acquainted with the Night, accepting the invitation to a loving wholeness promised to the listener in Walcott's Love After Love. I spoke earlier about finding and testing vocations. We tend to apply the idea rather narrowly. Clergy, monks and nuns are expected to have a vocation. Doctors and teachers might have one. And that's about it. So vocation can be seen as limited to choice of profession, and only a few professions at that. But isn't the kingdom of God within you too, all the time, and don't you have many options as to how and how far you commit to making the kingdom manifest. Do you think you could find for yourself ways of doing this that are honest and realistic for you, but about which the best part of you could be passionately enthusiastic? If so, 
Of course, you will often fail to live up to your commitment. You will get tired, selfish, doubting, fed up, annoyed, in summary, reacquainted with the light. But when has that ever been a good reason to give up? Try, succeed a bit, fail. Try, succeed a bit, fail. Try, succeed a bit, fail. Such is the human condition in finding and following commitments that come from a place of deep wholeness and go to a place of deep needs. But it's worth it, isn't it? To love after love.